So William, and this one just, so hydrogen peroxide spray changed the way I can garden maybe three or four years ago. It's a really disinfectant. You spray the tomato leaves or you spray the plant leaves and it's really gone in 24 hours. It contacts the problem, the fungus kills it and then it's gone. I love hydrogen peroxide. It is, has allowed me to plant my tomatoes much more closely. I use less sprays. It just works really, really well. Um, and if you know you want to kind of follow me for 2022, I'll be going over the hydrogen peroxide sprays again, but you can find them on my channel if you just keyword search that. All right, so test spraying was one of them. The other one is, and this is number 14. The other big thing is people actually, for new gardeners, hesitate in getting started. Sometimes they're so overwhelmed that they feel like they have to read a lot of the videos, um, watch a lot of the videos, read a lot of information. Just try and get out into the dirt, fill a container, dig a hole, get started, because you're going to make mistakes, but get started. Once you get started, the anxiety comes down and you can really start having um, a better experience, you're going to start having fun and you can start learning a lot of things and expand. So kind of, you know, start small, but definitely get out there. Don't, don't overthink it. Um, well, that was number 15. You start too big and you get overwhelmed. The other, the flip side of that is some people are slow to get started. Then sometimes people go out and they carve out a thousand square foot garden and they have 15 raised beds and everything's going well till the summer comes. The plants are really big. They're getting diseases and problems that they're not used to they get overwhelmed. So start at the size that you can manage and keep in mind midsummer. So when the tomatoes are full size, when your peppers are full size, when those zucchinis that just start out small are really big and it'll give you time to see how much time you have in your life to actually manage a larger garden before or manage a garden before you really expand it to something big. All right, let me just check here real quick for questions. All right, so far so good. Looks like the connection is working. Um, and I'm gonna go through all of these. It might be an hour, it might be shorter. Um, but if you're just joining, we are gonna be giving away um, gift cards to the seed shop. All right, number 16. I think that this is a pretty common mistake and we tend to do it over and over again is we pick the wrong size container for tomatoes and peppers. So a tomato plant, this is a pretty big size container. This would be okay for one pepper plant. Make sure there's drainage holes in here. But it's not good enough for a tomato plant. I now recommend really 10-gallon to 20-gallon containers for a tomato plant. The root systems just get massive. So when you first put in your little transplant, it looks cute. It looks great. But you have to think midsummer again. When that tomato plant is full size or your cucumbers are full size, and that root system is just sucking the life out of that soil, all the water, all the nutrients. And if your pot is too small, it just, it's just not going to work. You're better going with a larger container. Underwater, underfertilized container plant. So that's a mistake a lot of us make. So a container this size, like watering it in um, April, May might not be so bad because the pepper would be smaller. It's not so hot, but then it gets warmer and the plant gets bigger. So where you're only watering maybe every two or three days, now you have to water every day. And then in some cases, twice a day. If your container plant dries out just one time, it messes up the whole production of the plant. So you have to really keep in mind the size of the plant, the weather when it's starting to get hot, and you may have to water these plants twice a day. Fertilizing becomes a big issue too. We can set this up in April with lots of fertilizer, manures, compost, whatever we want. It's growing well. Again, when that plant gets big, it's sucking the life out of the soil. So you really might have to go to feeding your plants, you know, July, midsummer, uh, early summer, even late summer, every week with a water soluble fertilizer, just to give it enough nitrogen to stay green, keep producing and stuff like that. Um, and again, I would go back to the journal and kind of track how you water and feed your plants until you kind of get a system that, that really seems to work. Checking for questions again real quick. Yeah, somebody wrote, determinate tomatoes are good for five-gallon pots. That's true. There's two types of tomatoes, the indeterminate, the ones that keep growing and growing and growing. If you're just growing a determinate tomato that gets to a set size, produces, and dies off, 
you can hang around a five gallon container. But if you actually get to that 10 and 20 gallon container, you could grow the indeterminate or you could actually grow two determinants in there. So a bigger container um, may uh, work too for determinant tomatoes, but you can just add you know an extra plant into there. All right, so underwater earth and raised bed. So this is something that I practiced this year. I spent a lot of time actually watering my garden more. We get a lot of rain. I would water pretty regularly. But this year I was watering even in May before it really got hot, three times a week in July, four times a week, five times a week. And I really kept in mind that I wanted to soak that top four to six inches of the soil. That keeps the surface roots cool. That really kept everything thriving. It really worked out well. You do want to water deeply, but like if you go online and it says water once a week for uh, one inch, you know, give your plants one inch of water, they're going to survive. Like they're not going to die off, but they're not going to thrive. So you really want to increase the amount of moisture that you're putting into your garden. Deep watering, you know, top six inches of watering, but you want them to thrive. You don't want to just give them that one inch of water and they don't die off, but they're, you know, they're not producing as, as well as they should. Let's check. Oh, hello, Callie Kim. I don't know if you were here earlier for the fiasco, but uh, the internet went down, everything froze. So I've just kind of restarted. Um, let's go to 18 because I didn't finish it. So watering your plants are really important. Sometimes the raised beds, we think that we're underfeeding them. Your earth beds don't need nearly as much fertilizer than your containers. And I just want to restress that again. Container plants need a lot of care, more water, more feedings, especially when they're big. That's a really big mistake we make is that we kind of, you know, slow down on taking care of the plants and then they die off. All right. Number 19. So th this is pretty common. Um, we panic and spray all plants when we see a problem. So it's not uncommon if you're just getting started is you see something on your cucumber plant, you get a spray, you spray, and then you think, well, the tomatoes are never close to it. Let me spray the tomato plant. And you're like, well, maybe I'll go over and get the pepper plant. Then all of a sudden, we're spraying all the plants with the spray that's just meant for the cucumber plant. You don't have to do that. You have to kind of practice being disciplined and really identify the problem and match the spray to it. It's tempting, you know, you, you worry, some beetles just don't go from the cucumber plant to the tomato plant. So you don't have to do that, that spray. The other problem, very similar, number 20. 20 is we panic and we spray our whole arsenal, everything we have. That uh, broccoli plant's going to get neem oil, peppermint oil, rosemary oil. It's going to get some Captain Jack's dead bug dust after everything dries. I'm going to hit it with some baking soda, even though I'm treating it for an insect. I'm throwing fungus uh, spray on there. Don't go crazy and put tons of stuff on your plant out of panic. Pick one product and kind of learn how it works in your garden. And that could be neem oil. I use that for most of my leafy greens, cabbages, kales, etc. I use rosemary oil or peppermint oil on the undersides of my cucumber plants. It works wonderful uh, against spider mites. I also use it on beans. So know what your sprays are for. Don't put tons of different things on a plant. The other thing, too, is once you put a spray down, you got to wait three days, five days, seven days, and just look to see if it's working. Um, some stuff like neem oil takes a while for the, the insect to die off. Let me take a look for the questions. Uh, Jeannie Mario says neem oil is all purpose for me. And neem oil is really good. Here's the thing, too. We're going to talk about packaging in a second. If you buy online neem oil and it says hydrophobic extract of neem, it's basically garbage. It could be any kind of oil. Oil itself, any kind of oil, smothers insects, smothers mold or fungus or something like that. The neem oil has a chemical compound in there called azadiractin. And you want cold-pressed neem oil. That's what we sell at our shop. But wherever you buy it, you want cold pressed neem oil with the azadiractin in there. That's the compound that gets on the leaves. The insects eat it. They die off. It shuts down their stomach. It really messes them up. For some reason, companies create a hydrophobic extract. 
They take out all the good stuff. They call it neem oil, and they say it does three different things, and it does. It's a, a fungicide, a miticide, um, and I don't remember what the third one is. But any oil will be a fungicide, or any oil will be a miticide. The oil covers the soft-bodied insect. It suffocates. Yeah, and Kim, I see overlove our plants too much. So Kim and I, if you don't know, we have a podcast called Gardening Coast to Coast. And the whole goal of uh, Gardening Coast to Coast, the podcast, is to really simplify gardening, gives us really an opportunity to talk with each other. Because sometimes doing YouTube videos, it's kind of a solo thing, although you got camera guy, which I'm always jealous of. I like the interaction. But we're really packing in a lot of information that you can listen to uh, while you're out in the garden doing garden chores that we may not love to do, like weeding and stuff like that. All right. Plant number 21. Plant cool weather crops too late and don't plant them again in the summer for uh, a fall garden. So your cool weather crops really need to go into the garden pretty early here in Maryland Zone 7. That's somewhere, you know, sometimes March, beginning of April. They like the cool ground. The root systems like to be 40 or 50 degrees. You have to get them in early so they slowly develop and, and do their thing. If you put a cool weather crop in, say, the end of May, they sprout really quickly and they start going. But now the soil's too warm, your lettuce bolts it flowers, and your cool weather crops just don't end up doing as well. The other mistake is cool weather crops do really good in Maryland in similar zones where you have, you know, a fall that goes from September, October, some frosting in November, and maybe even into December. You can plant your cool weather crops when the soil's too warm, like in August. They establish, then that cool rolls in. And I have better success with my cool weather crops September, October, November than I do sometimes growing from uh, March and April, you know, into May or early June. All right, I haven't been watching, but Jeff, have you given away a gift certificate? Yes, you can just type yes. If not, let's do one and randomly pick somebody from there. Just buzzing through here looking for any questions. And it looks like things are working before. I don't know what happened, but here where I'm at, like last night we had 40, 50 mile hour gun whisk, uh, wind gusts, and it's been windy today, and maybe it knocked out the internet earlier. All right, let's see. We are on number 22. So this is sort of, if you want to pay a lot of money for bagged soils, that's perfectly fine. It's a convenience. But they're way too expensive. They're all the same thing. They're basically peat moss, some sort of earth, and then fertilizer. And it's misleading. They put a lot of words on there. I know miracle Grow says two times the bounty, blah, 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 great stuff. And then when you look at the little asterisk on the bottom left corner, it says compared to unfertilized potting mix. I mean, th that's kind of cheesy and it's wrong. So don't spend extra money for something that's telling you it does wonderful things. You're just looking for a basic potting mix, container mix. It has peat moss, some other stuff on there. Get what's on sale or make your own or um, contact a local landscaping company, check out their product if they're close, and just have it delivered and dumped on your driveway if you have the room. And it's a cheaper way to do things, especially if you're filling raised beds. But it could be two or $300 to fill a large um, raised bed that's maybe three feet by six feet wide, um, 18 inches tall. So, you know, don't get fooled by packaging. Uh, let's see. Uh, Wendy Loom just caught this. What do you do for spider mites? Spider mites have been an issue for me on cucumbers and beans forever until I started spraying the undersides with peppermint oil or rosemary oil or a combination of both. I'm not positive which one is better, but those two oils together kill off the, the spider mites. It really, really has made a difference. And it smells great. And you would just spray that sometimes once a week. When you mix uh, peppermint oil, rosemary oil into a sprayer, it can sit there for weeks. It's just the, the oil that, you know, you need. It's no special process. So spray the undersides. Do that once a week. Your plants will love you for it. All right. So number 23, they pay way too much for bagged fertilizers or we give our plants too much love, which I know uh, Kim was saying earlier too. 
So bagged fertilizer, it's a convenience. You really need that, I think, for containers. Not everybody can grow compost um, or make compost. I really recommend looking to pay a dollar to maybe a dollar fifty per pound for organic fertilizers. You you just don't have to spend two two fifty a pound. Some packaging will say all this great stuff on there, and it's all the same ingredients. It's blood meal, bone meal, uh, chicken manure, feather meal, a couple other things thrown in. It's just organic fertilizer. Read the, the ingredients, try and pay less for it. Uh, nowadays, a lot of fertilizers say they've got microbes and bacteria and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that is true. You need that for your garden. Container mix, throw in a couple handfuls of soil from your yard. That will bring life into there. Um, you can, you know, use that. You know, it, they're, they're not lying to you. It's just expensive. So, you know, figure out what works for your budget. All right, number 24. This one is kind of hard to phrase. New gardeners and seasoned gardeners and myself, probably not Kim because she's a garden genius. Um, <laughs> all right, I had a laugh. Um, we don't fully understand the cautions to take into the garden. For instance, everybody is told Chemical fertilizers are deadly, bad, kill soil life, um, are like crack for your plants. That's somewhat true. The chemical fertilizers, everything's a chemical, by the way, but the human-made fertilizers, if you use them at high concentrations day after day, not every two weeks, not every four weeks, not wisely, eventually you will create a concentration of chemical salts, that's what they're called, salts, not table salt, although table salt falls into the salt category. What happens is you put it, you create a concentration of chemical salts in the soil, pulls the water out of your plant, kills microbes, it's a problem. But you would have to put down so much and only use that to really harm your plants. Plants that use that fertilizer don't produce poor quality plants, they can't harm you. But I do agree is that you don't want to use chemical fertilizers only. Really try and be organic. Really try and use compost. That's what I do now. The other thing, for example, is like don't turn your soil or you need microbes or everything has to be in line. If you mess up the layers of your soil, the plants aren't going to thrive. That's not true. You can turn your soil with your shovel, the top six or eight inches, and you may want to do that because you have clay soil or you're introducing compost in there. Any, as I always say, any self-respecting microbe or earthworm are going to realign themselves. Once microbes and bacteria start multiplying, it's millions and billions of divisions and all that. Your soil life is going to be fine. You don't have to take a tiller and just grind your soil down. That's going to shred up all the worms. That's bad. But just putting a shovel in and flipping your soil over, that's okay. No dig gardens are wonderful. You put down cardboard, you put six inches of compost on there, you plant into it plants do well. We all don't, ha don't have that. But don't let that style and great design of a no-dig garden make you think you can't turn your garden and that you're harming your garden. I hope that makes sense. The bottom line is, is when you learn about things online or from me or from anybody, you know, think about it, challenge it a little bit, test it out, see if it's true, and, and go ahead and, you know, figure out what works best for you. Now, and, you know, I just saw something buzzing through. Too much of one chemical mineral offsets others. Yeah, you can get into all that. Like you could, you know, lock out certain nutrients by having too much magnesium in your soil, or you can put in too much calcium and change the pH, and then um, different uh, nutrients don't get pulled into the plant. But you really have to wreck your garden for that to happen. And what do I mean by that? The granular fertilizers or even the chemical fertilizers that you're putting down, they're important. But neither are really organic matter. Yeah, organic fertilizers get chewed up by microbiology and soil life. But you really want to put in organic material like um, compost, fully broken down manures, rotted, well-rotted uh, composted grass clippings, leaf mold. You really want that bulk of organic matter mixed into your garden. That's what it needs. That's what the soil life needs. Um, that's what holds water. That's what creates a great root system. That's what creates a great structure of different uh, microbiology through your soil and worms digging through there. It's the actual 
bulk of organic matter. All right, where are we at? And we've done this in 27 minutes. All right, so I'm going to go back to the first 10 that I did earlier shortly. Um, well, number 25 is really we don't start composting soon enough or we don't start collecting leaves. I understand you might not have the room, so I always recommend maybe family or friend you can do it. But you don't have to do fancy composting with all these systems where you rotate it every seven days, you're hot composting, you're breaking it down. I have a compost bin that I've just been filling for the last three years. I haven't even touched that one. I have another one where it's more hot composting and I rotate things. And then I have leaves that I just put into a trash can. I am getting the most amazing leaf mold by just throwing leaves into a trash can and into a pen and letting it sit. And I'll be using that really in full next year. So my point is, is you need that bulk organic matter. Don't overthink composting. Set up a pen with some chicken wire. Um, if you have pallets, you can build, you know, a nice space, but just fill it up with leaves, cut grass, let it rot, let it do its thing. Even if it takes a year for it to break down, you're going to have that in a year. And if you just keep the composting going, then you're going to end up with a continuous supply. And that's where you're going to save a ton of money. That's where you're going to have a, a healthier garden. You can use that compost in your containers. You can use it in the earth beds. Um, it doesn't have to be fancy is my point. All right, let's see. So that was number 25. We'll go back to the other 10. I'm going to just check for questions. And I think we should certainly give away another gift card, brother. Um, if you've already done two, let's just do another one. I feel bad that this just didn't go smoothly from the beginning, but I think it's going okay now. Uh, just a mom says, so is guinea pig poo garden love it? Not sure if she's asking the question or say they love it. I'm actually allergic to guinea pigs. It's the first animal that I found when I was a kid. I went um, to a friend's house. I had a guinea pig. It was cute and all that. My eyes swelled out from the bottom, like really far. It was the most bizarre thing. So I don't have much affection for guinea pigs. Uh, Richard White, cool. I have plenty of leaves here in Big Piney, Wyoming. Definitely use your leaves. Like, Organic gardening is not really going and saying, here's a list of organic certified products that can be used in your garden and you'll be an organic. Like, we don't need people to tell us that. Organic gardening is really going out and using the resources around you. Um, you know, for me personally, what I don't really care what fertilizer I'm using. I'm like 90% compost now. I don't really care about the fertilizers. That That's not really a big deal. What I care about is the actual chemical sprays that you put on leaves to kill disease and control fungus. That to me was always my biggest concern with organic issue. I just, I want to know what I'm spraying on my plants. I don't want something in a can that I don't really understand. Um, but definitely go out, look around, get your grass, get your leaves um, and start, you know, composting. If you have a farm that's local to you, maybe start a relationship. They always have more compost, uh, horse manure, cow manure sometimes than they need. Maybe you can get that. Uh, Candace Fitz Fitzgerald, I'm in uh, Virginia Zone 7. I tried squash and zucchini for the first time. The squash bugs are fierce. I used neem oil, but eventually gave up. So neem oil doesn't seem to work well with squash bugs. What I do is I'm growing fewer squash and zucchini so that I can really concentrate on the plants. As they grow, I take the flowers and leaves off the stem that goes into the ground. I put insect dust on there. Now, I typically use Captain Jack's dead bug dust. You can use seven dust, which is not organic. Captain Jack's is organic. The key is, is getting the dust on the stem because the squash bugs will crawl through that. The other thing I like to do is when I water, I really soak the base around that squash plant because the squash bugs don't like it. Don't like it. They crawl up the stem and I catch them and squash them. Also turn the leaves over, inspect for those orange eggs under there and you just, you just remove them. So it takes a bit of work, but I found using that dust on the stem really works well for squash bug eggs. And Captain Jack's organic works. Seven also works. There's a lot of other dust. Now, organic doesn't really matter for insects. If you're throwing an organic dust down trying to kill squash bugs, that's great. But you're also going to kill bees and you're going to kill other things. So just because it's organic doesn't mean it doesn't hurt the good insects. So you want to put it right on the stem 
you want to remove flowers and you just want to reduce the chance of the pollinators coming over to that stem and they won't if the flowers are down further on the zucchini plant. Kim asks, yes, you are composting. She puts four to six inches down on her beds over the winter, throws scraps on there. Even if that all doesn't break down, like if you could take your beds and you just throw in four inches of um, leaves, worms will break that down. You know, bacteria will break that down. Mold will break that down. Some of it might blow away. If it's not all broken down, just kind of, you know, move it to the side if you're going to do seeds because seeds will need something better soil-wise. If you're doing transplants, just move a space out, put the transplant in, put the leaves back around it. Now you have a great mulch. And that's a great way just to keep things going is you put the leaves down, come spring, you put a little bit of grass on there. Don't overdo it with the grass in the summer because it gets too hot, just maybe an inch or something until it dries and browns. But you can compost that way too. It's just put that organic matter, you know, in small layers on top of your beds. It works really, really well. Thank you, Morty. I am very glad. Um, I, it's, like, it's always weird because I'm talking to you. I comment to you. I haven't gotten to really meet people yet, but I really enjoy the interaction, I guess is my point. Let's see. All right, so that was number 25. So we still have 12 minutes. Um, I have no idea if we've given stuff away, uh, brother, if you could just type what we've done, that'd be great. If not, let's do that. So let's go back to the first 10 that I did before. And I did have some props. Um, they're all spread out here from the first run. So number one, overing over, and this all has to do with really seed starting. So the, the mistake that is pretty common is people overwater their seed starts they underwater their seed starts, or they don't know when to do that. So here is the example. Just give me a second. I, I did have everything nice and organized. So as I did a question, I would pull it over. But the internet messed that up. So right here is seed starting mix that is nice and light. That means it needs to be watered. When your seed starting mix goes from dark to light it always dries from the top first so there's plenty of moisture down here after it dries like this a day or two later water from the bottom that's how you'll be able to water your plants perfectly you want this to sit you know a day or two by letting the top dry it helps kind of manage molds and fungus and even sometimes fungus nets but this is dry this is wet this is twice as heavy as this and you can kind of get a sense of when you need to water this is when you need to water Number two is people don't keep their seeds in an airtight container. And this is a great way to save money. These are um, Bentley Seed. We work with this company. I highly recommend them. There's tons of seeds in here. You know, and the seeds that you get from our shop, there's tons of seeds in there. You might only grow four tomato plants. What are you going to do with those other 35 seeds. Well, put them in a Ziploc bag or an airtight container because seeds will definitely last three years, five years, seven years, 10 years in some cases. So, you know, you spend two bucks on a pack, you use five seeds, but you can keep using these. That's a, just a great way to save money. Or we lose track of them or we plant from them and we leave them outside. Take care of them. You'll save yourself a lot of money by just going back to them year after year. And when they don't germinate, that's when you need to buy more seeds. Let's check here. John Lombardo, thanks for watching. I'm very glad to help. Now, gumball breath. Now, I've used rock wool before. That's a starting medium that you can um, use. I don't know a lot about it, so I haven't done a video on it. But there are other mediums that work really, really well. So on that note, most seed starting mix is peat moss based. And peat moss itself often has fungus net eggs in there. That's just the way it is. It doesn't matter on the company or whatever. It's just in there. So I like to just take my seed starting mix, put it into a container like this, saturate it with boiling water. It kills everything in there, including soil life. Now the key is, is you don't need soil life for seed starts. I recommend just a sterile starting mix, just like the rock wool. When a seed germinates, it lives off the coat, after it's growing for 10 or 12 days, some mild liquid fertilizer, organic, chemical type, 
is great. You're going to have a great seed start or a great transplant. We're just growing transplants. When that plant gets outdoors and into the ground, that's when you can have all the soil life you want and need and your plant will really do better for it. But it doesn't need it as a seed start. Now, if you, you know, and that's fine. You don't have to agree with me. I, I'm fine with that. I just don't want you to get fungus gnats. So if you want to have soil life in your seed starting mix, sterilize it. You can add in worm castings. Um, you can add in sometimes fish emulsion or organic fertilizers will have some soil life. Or you can just do this. Get a container that seals really well. Put in some of your starting mix in here. Just use cool water. And then let it sit in here for probably 10 to 14 days. If it has any kind of eggs in there, usually they'll hatch. I'd have to look up fungus nut eggs. I don't know how long they take to hatch. But you're just putting it in here with a lid. If you don't see any fungus gnats, you don't see any problems after two weeks, you can mix this soil into your sterilized mix and you'll have your soil life. And it's just really, really important not to get fungus gnats. So that means you might do this, you know, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks before you're ready to, you know, plant um, if you want to add in, you know, the soil life, you know. Sterile mix, you can sterilize that. You can use it that day once it cools down. All right, let's see. Questions. Uh, James has never had fungus gnats. I hope you never do. Probably if you took a poll, 70% of us have had fungus gnats. Not every year I don't get them. And even sometimes when I do this, I get lazy don't do it really well. I don't put in enough hot water. I think, oh, that's fine. I end up with fungus gnats. All right. So where are we? Number four. Um, a common mistake people make when you're first starting is we have a sunny windowsill. It's not getting direct sunlight. Maybe it gets an hour or two. We start everything on air. They germinate. We're excited. And then we have plants that look like human hair. They just get tall and spindly. They're falling over. There's just not enough light 99 times out of 100 on a windowsill. Certain plants will do okay on there, but generally speaking, if you're doing tomatoes and peppers and all kinds of different things, a windowsill is not going to cut it. So, you know, that temptation we all have, we try and start on the sunny windowsill, and it really just kind of leads to disappointment. Your plants will get leggy. They'll fall over. What happens is they don't have enough sun, so they kind of think they're still in the soil so they're putting all their energy into getting taller and taller and taller trying to get to the sun and it's just not going to happen number five overspend on grow lights for transplants so we're just at least what i talk about is we're just growing transplants so you don't need the three four hundred dollar systems of fancy colored lights um red uh yellows blues whatever colors they are they work they're excellent they're excellent for growing from seed to flowering, to fruiting. So if you're doing something like that indoors for full production, you're going to need a better grow light system. For transplants, just pick up a white LED shop light, not a grow light, a shop light. They cost $15 to $25. Check out my videos. That's what I'm using now. Um, I already have videos that talk about the ratings and stuff like that. But those shop lights will work really well. About an inch over your plant, as the plant grows, raise it up you'll have great seed starts, but you just don't have to spend a lot of money on lights unless you want to. Number six, um, so we start seeds way too early or we start them way too late. There's a timing. So I can grow a tomato plant in here for 12 weeks or 16 weeks. It's going to start to flower. It's going to start to think it's mature. If you keep them indoors too long, they start to go to flowering and production and you don't want that to happen. You want them to get big but just be ready to be flowering when they get outside. So you're getting a jump on the season by getting that four weeks or six weeks of growth indoors. Tomatoes are a good example. We could start way too early and they're in here for 12 weeks or 16 weeks. We could start too late and it's, you know, pretty much you just put them in the ground. Why are you starting them indoors? But the problem is the timing. Let me just, you want to time the growth of your transplants to be able to go outside into your containers or on a deck or into the ground when the temperatures are right. That's what really matters. The above ground temperature, the ambient temperature, 
and the earth temperature. And that takes us to number seven. Growing a tomato eight weeks indoors and then putting it into 40 or 50 degrees soil. And if you put a seed right next to that, that transplant is going to kind of struggle because the ground is too cold. That seed will start doing its thing and maybe break the surface. And as it warms up, it'll sprout up. Another plant will start going from purple to green because it's purple because it was too cold. That plant will actually catch up. So there's no point in putting your warm weather crops into cold soil. So the timing is really, really important. So what do I mean by that? May 15th, my soil's warm. Frost is usually gone, but the soil's warm enough. I count back eight weeks. Uh, what is that? <laughs> March 15th. That's when I start my tomato plants. So they come May, 18th, or May 15th. They're ready to go into the warm ground. Nice, smooth transition, those plants take off. Hope that makes sense. The warm ground is more important, in my opinion, than the ambient temperature for your warm weather crops. They need that warmth in the root system to, to really take off. Uh, number eight, the biggest mistake is people don't buy my book, The Modern Homestead Garden. You know. Just, I don't know. I, <laughs> everyone's like, plug your book, plug your stuff or whatever. I, I don't know. I feel awkward with that. But anyway, the book really matches how I create videos. Um, it's really geared to teach you principles, um, to kind of make you think. You don't have to follow it 100%, but it's just a nice outline in my approach to going out and growing vegetables. And it's really about any size backyard, which means is you've got to learn. So you may not have two acres. You may not have a backyard, but you can start your homestead living style by growing where you can, um, using that produce in your house, and just kind of the changing the way you live, learn the skills. And that's what the book helps teach you how to do. Uh, number nine, stratification. So that's the process of chilling your seeds for four weeks to eight weeks so that they germinate well. Seeds that don't germinate well for us are lavender, rosemary, chives sometimes. They need a cold period. And, and what is stratification about? So just think about all your perennial plants that drop seed in the fall. If they hit the ground, started to sprout, the freeze came in, they're going to die. That plant's not going to be able to really reproduce itself. So when those seeds hit the ground, before they can germinate, they need a four-week, eight-week, 12-week period of cold weather, like usually 32 degrees, sometimes freezing. Um, after they get that, that seed is now ready to germinate once the warmth comes. But without that you know, buffer of having to have a cold period, a lot of your seeds would germinate in the fall when they fall, and then they're not available to germinate in the spring, and that plant would die off. They want The plants want to germinate early spring as the warmth is coming so that they can grow and mature. So if we take lavender seeds right from the fall drop, they're collected. We put them in our house, it's warm. We put them into our seed starting mix. They don't germinate that well because they didn't get that stratification period. So throw those seeds into um, your refrigerator for four weeks or eight weeks, that will work. I have a whole um, blog article on it. That Jeff will throw in the link. It talks about the 35 plants that I grow that could use stratification. If you don't stratify, that's okay. They're still going to germinate, but the germination rate won't be as good. And sometimes it can take four, five, six weeks for germination to happen. Stratification will really help with um, success for your seed starts. All right. This is the last one. Number 10, don't keep lights on long enough or close enough for your seed start. So if you're starting indoors, you have the lighting system set up. Sometimes people put the lights six or eight inches too close. You want to be down one or two inches. If for some reason your lights are too intense, yes, you're going to damage your plants, but now you know, raise them up a little bit. You always want to keep them somewhere between, you know, two to six inches and get bigger. When they're first germinating, you want to be really close so when that seed breaks the surface, it's getting the light it needs, and it's not going to grow tall and try and be leggy. So keep it close. And usually, nowadays, I recommend keeping the lights on 14 to 16 hours while you're waiting for germination and maybe for a week after germination. You can start reducing the amount of time the light's on as a plant's finger, and you can raise them up, you know, 
when plants start getting bigger, um, they can deal with more change. But when they're small, they're looking for intense light, like right away. All right. So that was 25 common mistakes we all make. Um, we're at 47 minutes. This was take two. Thank you for the people that stuck with me. Um, I think it turned out pretty well. So let's use the last 13 minutes just to ask for questions. I'm going to be looking at the uh, chat here and we'll just go with questions. And if you type the word question really big, then I'll be able to see it better. So Hindi 360, in your recent videos, you talk about bone meal. However, I can't find bone meal, bone meal where I live. Could you give me some other tips for root vegetables, potatoes, please? So that's a good thing too. Since we are kind of guarding from around the globe, some materials aren't available. So any form of phosphorus will replace bone meal. Bone meal also has a lot of calcium. So you can get rock phosphate, which sounds like a chemical, but it can be organic if it's mined um, in a specific way, let's just say. So you can get rock phosphate. It's pretty powerful, but go ahead and use that. Um, wood ash has some phosphorus in it, but it's more potassium and it has some calcium in there. A lot of calcium, actually. You could use that. But I don't have a specific recommendation. What you're looking for the bone meal is phosphorus. So, you know, maybe search online or if people, actually, I'm, I'm sure somebody listening right now, you probably have alternative sources to bone meal. So why don't you throw them out there and help um, uh, Hindi 360 out? That's a good question. Just because I say bone meal or blood meal, you don't have to get that exact product. It's just really the element that I'm looking for, either phosphorus, potassium, um, nitrogen, of course, sulfur, calcium, magnesium. All right. Any more questions? Um, Tom Seldom. Do I need a bottom on my raised bed or can I leave it open to the earth? Uh you can do either. So I have something I call more of a framed bed. If the beds are like, I don't know, six inches, eight inches, I just make a frame. The bottoms are open. Earthworms can move through there. Root systems go down there. That's how I have my main garden set up. If I were to be growing maybe on concrete or maybe a rocky surface where the earth isn't great, I might have a bottom. And then I would, I would fill it up. But nine times out of 10, I would go with an open bottom on your raised bed because water will drain through there. Earthworms will come up through there. Soil biology will come up through there. Root systems will go down into the earth. So it's just a nice combination. The raised bed frame allows you to really um, concentrate resources into that space. You're not walking on it. You know, it's a good way to go. All right. Still got 10 minutes. Let's see if I may have any more questions. Um, Jim Christensen says that raccoons and possums would dig if they smell bone meal. That's true too. And that's where it gets into like com well broken down compost animals don't want because it's all broken down. So that's why they don't really bother bother with it. But if you're putting in blood meal and bone meal, it's it's a chance that cats, dogs, um, other animals come and dig up your garden. I haven't had that happen, but it's not uncommon. So sometimes you may want to use that in the fall after you're done gardening, where you're not coming back for three, four, five months. Any animal that gets in there and messes around with it, that's fine, but it's going to break down with the soil biology and it's going to, you know, be available for your plant. If you put down fresh bone meal and blood meal sometimes around your plants, something comes in and digs them up. That also happens with fish emulsion because they like the smell. Richard White, I heard blood meal and bone meal work awesome for any vegetable. Is that true? Blood meal is nitrogen. It's uh, bovine pig blood, freeze dried. Uh, bone meal is phosphorus and calcium. It's crushed cattle bone. Um, they work great because they provide phosphorus and nitrogen, but they in themselves aren't anything special. They're just giving you nitrogen and phosphorus. And that's 
what you're kind of looking for. If you, you know, if you're going to pick something nitrogen wise, blood meal is great. If you're going to pick something for phosphorus, bone meal is great. And it's usually less expensive too. I would rather buy just blood meal, bone meal, blend it together, throw in some wood ash for potassium, make my own fertilizer. It ends up being cheaper if I'm not using compost and stuff like that. Uh, Hindi 360 uh, gets another question read. No success with chives. The average temp is 70 to 85 degrees. Any tips? Chives are something that I found need stratification. So when you get your chi your chive, yeah, when you get your chive seeds, stick them in a refrigerator for eight weeks. Let them get through that cold period, and you should end up with better germination for your chives. What's uh, Tammy Davis question? What's your recommendation for aphids on peppers brought into overwinter? Uh, my recommendation is. That's why I would use, if you can, organic insect spray, um, soapy water spray, a chemical spray. Because you're not going to be eating the plant, you know, I wouldn't mind chemicals if needed. Sometimes you need something really strong if things get out of control. What I think is you could probably take your peppers outdoors, um, spray them really hard with a hose, knock off the aphids, hit them with a soapy water spray. Um, maybe peppermint oil or something like that, and you'll be able to take care of them. So you could definitely go organic. But, you know, take them outside, clear them off. And that's something that happens a lot. If you bring plants indoors, there's a chance that they're going to bring in fungus molds and insects. So you really want to clean your plants um, well before you take them indoors. Also, don't use outdoor compost or soil for your seed starts. You just, you'll create an insect and the reason being is, think about it, it's set about 70 degrees in the house. They got moisture, they got food, and they have no natural predators. So they just go crazy. All right. Let's see. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, all micronutrients are necessary throughout the growing process. True. Um, in different levels, you know, the macronutrients, nitrogen, you need a lot. Phosphorus, potassium, less than that. And then you get to calcium, magnesium, um, sulfur, less. And then you have micronutrients, just a little bit. But you don't, as a gardener, that's probably a common thing, is you don't have to take care of all of that. You know, compost will do that. A basic N, P, and K fertilizer will do that. We can make ourselves crazy trying to manipulate everything. Let nature do the work, you know. Um, don't go overboard. All right, five minutes. Type question if you have any more questions. Jason Fraser said, my peanuts never grow. So this is the first year I grew peanuts. I didn't do any videos on it because it was just a test run. They were really successful. Um, I grew them in containers, so they were well-drained. I kept them well-fed with fish emulsion, and they really did well. I don't know if that will help you out. Um, but next year I'm going to grow more peanuts. So Richard White has a good thing, not using any pork products. Um, what's a good alternative? So this is kind of where organic gardening as a label bothers me. Organic gardening as a principle is wonderful. It's what people have been doing for hundreds and thousands of years. So, he says he doesn't want to use pork products. That's fine. So you look for an alternative. That alternative might be phosphorus that, you know, chemical engineer Garrett goes out, finds some rock phosphorus, adds in some, you know, acid to it, breaks that phosphorus out. He doesn't make poison. He doesn't make toxins. But you have phosphorus and you can use it. That's okay. So alternatives, there's a lot. I mean, you just have to start reading the ingredients. You can use... Um, organic rock phosphate that's mined in a specific way. You can use processed rock phosphate. You can get chemical fertilizers that have phosphorus in it. Um, you can look for chicken manures, organic, that will have phosphorus in it. Um, alfalfa pellets have some phosphorus in it. They don't have the high level like bone meal. So if you're looking just for a higher level, that's hard to find, but you can you know, find it you know, in lower levels with other products. Q 
Kitty W, question, have you used molasses in your gardens and issues? I have not. I don't know if other people do that. Um, some people think it's good to feed the soil life. Um, molasses has been used. I have used it when I used to make teas to fuel the um, microbiology in the water so that it divides and all that, but I don't do that anymore. But I've not used it directly in the garden. Creations from within, Trisha, question, do you have a video on how you make um, your seed start soil, please and thank you. Um, so the starting mix and boiling water might be a bagged product, boiling water. I do have videos on how I make my seed starting mix. That was years ago. Um, it was mostly peat moss, some vermiculite. At that time, you probably saw me throw in some organic granular fertilizer. I don't do that anymore because there's no soil life in there. Organic granular fertilizers that would need to break down don't have the soil life. So I use a water soluble organic fertilizer because that's in the form that the plants can use. So I do have some videos on it, um, but it was years and years ago. Um, Andrea Vasquez says, I love your channel. My mom is asking me for your t-shirt for Christmas and she would like a taller cup for ice cream, for uh, ice coffee. That's a good idea. Are you going to have new colors for the t-shirt? So my, I'll let my brother put a link into the shirt. So that shirt that, that's there now is a t-shirt. We really like it. That one's going to stay, but we are coming up with new merchandise ideas and a, a, a tall cup, you know, for ice coffee is a good idea. Well, it's almost been one hour. Maybe we'll go over a little bit because, I mean, it was just such a fiasco for that 1 to 130 area. I was like, no, no, we'll, we'll keep we'll keep going. So I'm glad you guys came back. I'm glad everything is working. All right, question. All right. And uh, Hindi 360 gets another one. I heard the peppers are heavy feeders. How can I give them the right amount of nutrition, please? Really appreciate your knowledge. So peppers, I mean, they're not any, they're not heavy feeders like squash and cucumbers and zucchini and stuff like that. So for peppers, I just really set mine up. I have a lot of videos on it. I just did one recently. Um, where I'm growing in a container with the bottom cut out and that's sunken in the ground. I just put in handfuls of organic granular fertilizer, some bone meal, a potash, which is wood ash. You don't have to get crazy and follow that. You just need any basic organic granular, really kind of prime the area if it's a container or the growing area. Put your pepper plant in, give it a big drink of fish emulsion is what I recommend. Lots of nitrogen early. When it gets, you know, a little bit bigger, I don't know, well, that's a lot bigger, but I don't know, 12 inches, 14 inches, starts to flower. Cut back on the nitrogen. You don't want a lot of leaf growth and just kind of let them do their thing. If you're using bone meal, that's good to put on there. If you get your alternative that you're looking for, for potassium, I'm um, sorry, for phosphorus, that's a good idea to give it a, you know, midsummer feeding of something higher in phosphorus that just helps with flowers and fruit growth. Tammy, uh, Bolander, and maybe we'll end here, says, can you grow squash in a seven and a half gallon grow bag? So the answer is yes, you can. Um, you can get compact varieties of squash, what I recommend. I grow trailing varieties out in my yard. The thing is, is you can grow any plant in any size container in theory. Seven and a half gallons is enough for you to get some squash. But once that plant really starts taking off and the root system fills up that seven gallons, you may be having to water two or three times a day, depending on where you are and how hot your summer is. And you're going to really have to be putting in the fertilizers, water solubles. So really going to 15 or 20 gallons is best because it gives you that cushion of not having to worry so much about the water and it allows you to put more fertilizer in there. If that seven and a half gallon just dries out once and it's easy to do, you go away for Saturday, it's really hot, you don't come back late on Sunday, that plant's going to be affected. So for containers, it's about the container size, but it's also about making sure you can manage the water. 
Uh, we'll keep going. I see some more questions. Jonathan Lee, question, which NPK number should I look for in a fertilizer for feeding pea plants? So it is true that pea plants can fix their own uh, nitrogen from the atmosphere and stuff like that. Um, but generally speaking, what I say now for any plant you're growing, for setting up the soil, basic N, P, and K. Um, I usually say try and find around a 5, 5, 5 N, P, and K. That means it's balanced. <laughs> you probably can't do that. It's almost impossible. So if the numbers are like 3, 4, 5, you know, 5, 4, 2, it doesn't really matter. You're trying to represent all the N, P, and K. And just get whatever organic granular is on sale. For peas, if you're able to, a lower nitrogen number and a higher phosphorus and potassium number is best. They just don't need all that nitrogen. But the difference between 3% nitrogen and 6% nitrogen for your peas, you're not going to really notice a whole, much, a, whole, a whole lot. Uh, Richard White question, what does bone meal have in it? Bone meal is um, crushed cattle bone, steam crushed cattle bone. So it mostly has, I don't think it has any nitrogen. It has phosphorus and it has calcium in there. Oh, yeah, I just saw Kim said, send some questions to uh, Gardening Coast to Coast uh, at gmail.com. So it's Gardening Coast, number two coast. You can see it there for Gmail. Because we every month, too, we do a Q&A session on the podcast, and we just collect different questions. We're on podcast number nine, I think, Kim. Uh, Helen McClellan says, are there two types of zucchini? Do they all vine? There are more than two types of zucchini. Um, and I guess maybe you're thinking, or is there like a bush and a vining type? And yes, there are. There, I don't know the names, but different varieties might be more compact. Other varieties uh, trail and grow more vine-like, but they don't vine like cucumbers or something like that. Terry Williams says, I have sweet potatoes in smart pots. They're getting pretty tall. Should I trellis them or let them trail? You can do either. Um, I've been reading too. Next year, I'm going to probably prune my vines back to three or four feet. So I'm not going to let them grow as big in an experimental area. In theory, that's supposed to help develop uh, bigger uh, tubers. I don't know if that's true, but you can trellis them. You can, you know, let them crawl on the ground. All right. Well, I think it's time to go. Thanks for sticking with me through that first half an hour. Um, the internet seems fine now. I don't know what happened. You know, in the future, we'll do the same thing. If for some reason it doesn't work at one o'clock, we'll stick with it and we'll just start at 1.30. Thanks so much for watching. Please check our seed shop at therustedgarden.com and check out the podcast um, that Kim and I are doing. We're having a lot of fun with it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I can't find end stream. There we go.